And welcome again to Save to Serve and Prophesy Again Ministries for another study hour as we are journeying through the sanctuary with Jesus Christ. And before we begin, let's open up with a word of prayer at this time. Father in heaven, we thank you for your presence. We ask for a double portion of your Holy Spirit to break us, to mold us, and to fill us with your presence, your character, your power, that true revival in our homes, true reformation would take place in the hearts of each family member, specifically husband and wife. Bless us now, we pray, let nothing, let no one hinder the blessings you have in store for us is our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, friends, we are here going through this series on the family. As we're told in the book of Malachi chapter 4, verse 4 through verse 6, that in these last days, it is God's desire to set homes in order. And of course, we are here again this evening. So, Hillary, what's our title for this series? Well, of course, Marriage Reconciliation Through the Sanctuary. Amen. And our theme? Our theme for this evening is, What's My Role? Learn from Christ and His Church or Be Spewed Out. You know, friends, we have been receiving a number of feedbacks, number one, as well as just various questions. And I would like to make this qualification. And that is, while this study, this series, can be applied to every married couple, the sad reality is, is that unless husband and wife are willing to reconcile their marriage and to walk together through the sanctuary ministrations from the gate, out of court, all the way through to the most holy place, the principles herein in this series will not apply. Right. That's true. It will not apply to them as a couple because, as you said, both have to be willing to walk through the sanctuary together in order for reconciliation to take place in the marriage. However, if there is a person that desires to be reconciled to Christ and maybe the other spouse doesn't have any concern or doesn't want to, then, of course, that individual can take steps through the sanctuary to be reconciled to Christ. And as we're going throughout this series, I realize that these principles are not only applicable to husband and wife, but also to young people, adults who are considering getting married. These principles they can learn from, as well as to lay a solid foundation as they move forward. Let's get into our lesson. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 2. This is part 4 of this series, Marriage Reconciliation through the sanctuary. And while each session can stand alone, we want to encourage you to go back through. Please visit the previous sessions. They're very, very important. Let's move. Chapter 2 of Genesis. Let's take a look there at verse number 20 through verse 24. And friends, please get a notepaper, writing instruments, get your Bibles. And of course, if you can, get the book, The Adventist Home. All right? right? When God did create Adam and Eve, did they have a blissful, happy marriage? Yes, of course they did. Because when God created everything, he said everything was created good. So when he instituted the marriage relation, of course, that was good as well. And Adam and Eve were very happy in their marriage. And that's what we find in verse 20 through verse 24 of Genesis chapter 2. But something unfortunate took place. Sin entered. Adam and Eve sinned, right? And once they sinned, the Bible shows us that there was a great crisis in the marriage between Adam and Eve. Great crisis. And we saw how Adam took no responsibility for the marriage crisis. He began to blame God, blame the wife, blame Eve. 
Did Eve take responsibility? She didn't. Of course, she blamed the tempter, the serpent. And notice in chapter 3 of Genesis, let's take a look there at verse 12 and verse 13. Okay. Chapter 3, verse 12 and verse 13 of Genesis. Oh, verse 3, chapter 3. Amen. Okay. And the man said, the woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, what is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me mm. and I did eat. You know, what we're seeing right here is something that is a common occurrence in many broken marriages. Uh, as you mentioned, neither spouse is willing to take responsibility Correct. for the degradation of Correct. the marriage. It's always the other spouse's fault. It's always circumstances. It's always the devil, as it were, mm -hmm. without failing to take, I mean, while failing to take an introspect and see what am I doing to contribute, you know, to the deplorable condition of the relationship, of the marriage. And, and until we do this, there can be no solution. Amen. Let's take a look at the actual steps in the process of reconciliation between each of them, Adam and Eve, with God, and between Adam and Eve themselves as a married couple. Notice the first thing God did. In chapter 3 of Genesis, the first thing God did to work the work of reconciliation was to apply consequences. First thing, consequences to both Adam and Eve. Now, why do you think God, God did apply consequences to Adam and Eve? Adam, your work is going to be more difficult. Eve, in childbearing, it's going to be more difficult. Why would God apply consequences to well, both? Of course, they both transgressed, but they also both contributed to the crisis in the marriage. Both were guilty. Both were guilty. Responsible for the crisis. Look at number two. The second thing God did in reconciling Adam and Eve together and both to himself was to institute or establish in part the sanctuary service. Look at verse 21, chapter 3, verse 21. And from this, we realize from the very beginning, when there was a marriage crisis between Adam and Eve, the first thing God did, second thing God did was to institute, establish in part the sanctuary service. From this, we derive, deduce the theme, marriage, reconciliation through the, the sanctuary. Verse 21. Amen. Genesis 3. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothed them. That's it. And an animal had to be slain, sacrificed, right? Right. And this is in part the sanctuary service, as we can see right here. Right here on the screen, we see the outer court, primarily of the sanctuary. And what was placed on that altar, the brazen altar, the altar of sacrifice? Mm -hmm. A lamb. Exactly. The sin offering. Right. All right. And as we are here in the fourth part of this series, where are our brothers and sisters, the married couples online? Where are they in respect to the sanctuary? Well, if they've been doing the homework and following step by step, and applying the principles as we go forward, they're in the holy place at the table of showbread. Correct. Now, where does God want us as individuals and also us as a married couple? Where? In the most holy place. In that most holy where place. His presence is. And you know, God also showed um, the sacrifice as well in verse 15. Correct. The sacrificial system when he promised to put enmity. And of course, um, the head of the serpent would be bruised while the heel of the sacrifice, which we know is Christ, the woman's seed would be bruised. So it's showing us that sin offering. And because of Christ's death, it made this reconciliation of Adam and Eve possible. Through where? The sanctuary, through, the sanctuary. through Christ himself. Right. And what I'm realizing is that many times when there is a marriage crisis and husband and wife, they want to reconcile. Most of them, for the most part, they want uh, theories that are steeped in psychology steeped in reason and, and, and opinions. But we realize the gospel is the wonderful simplifier of life's problems. Amen. The gospel, yes. Ministry of Healing, page 363. And it is through the sanctuary, the gospel, the everlasting gospel, that Christ wants to use to reconcile husband with wife. The third thing God did in his work of reconciliation, number one, he reiterated 
the work he gave to Adam. Before sin, to Eve, before sin, what was that work he gave them? Well, to dress and to keep the garden. And that's in verse 15, right? Let's read that. Genesis 2, verse 15. To dress and to keep the garden. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden Correct. to dress it and to keep it. And after sin, was it the same work God gave to Adam and Eve? Yes. To dress and work. to keep. But same the work, work would be more difficult. And in verse 18, what work did God give to Eve? That she was to be a help meet for Adam in dressing and keeping the garden. So put this point down. The point here is to dress and to keep, correct? Yes. And what does dressing mean? To dress the garden. It means to till. That word dress mm -hmm. means to till, to turn yeah. over, to mm -hmm. plant, to till. And the word keep means to what? To maintain, to preserve. To protect. Mm -hmm. So to watch carefully. The very work God gave to Adam was not only to dress, to till, but also to keep, to preserve, to protect. And from this theme we derive husband. And the word husband also really means what? House band. House band, House band means what? To keep, mm -hmm. to protect, to preserve what? The home. The, thank the you family. so much. Look right. at Adventist home, page 211. The work of making home happy does not rest upon the mother alone. Fathers have an important part to act. The husband is the house band of the home treasures, binding by his strong, earnest, devoted affection, the members of the household, mother and children, together in the strongest bonds of union. Now watch this. His name, house band, is the true definition of husband. Now for those of you who are local, can you read that last sentence with me? I saw that but few fathers realize their responsibility or realize their roles, realize their God-given duties. Again, I saw that but few fathers, few husbands realize their roles, their responsibility. What is implied in that sentence, Hillary? Well, the first thing that comes to mind is that they don't understand their responsibility because they're not eating the bread. They're not reading and studying the word of God. But if, if you realize their responsibility, mm. it means that the majority don't understand their responsibility. Think about that. So there's no way that they could be carrying out their God-given role if they don't even understand what it is. And as a result, the marriages are broken down. Did you, did you comprehend that, friends? Now notice, put on your paper that God gave to Adam the work of dressing and keeping to preserving. Mm -hmm. That means the primary role of Adam was to, was to preserve, to protect. He was also to be the primary breadwinner. Put that down. The what, my friends? The primary breadwinner. To dress, to till. If you till something, if you plant something, what do you expect to receive? Increase. Increase. Of course. That was Adam's work primarily. And Eve's work was to be what? A help, help meet. meet. Now, this is a life and death situation. Let's take a look here at the role that God gave to husband. God gave to father. God gave to the man. And the only way man, husband, father, can understand his role, who must he imitate? Who must he follow? Who must he pattern after? Of course, our great exemplar, Jesus Christ. Yet, I saw that but few fathers, husbands, realize their, their role, responsibility. their responsibility. Let's turn quickly to the book of Genesis. Genesis, pardon me, Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. And on your note paper, write these two scriptures down. Isaiah chapter 54 and verse 5. What title does the, the Lord bear in that scripture? Husband. Husband. Mm -hmm. So if the literal husband is going to carry forward his God-given role, who must he pattern? The true husband. Amen. And 2 Corinthians is your second scripture. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2. Paul says, I have espoused you, the church, to be married to whom? One husband. Christ. Right. He's the husband. We must pattern the ministry of Jesus Christ. How Jesus 
relates to the church, his church. That's how we learn our roles as husbands. Because many marriages are broken because husbands are not performing their, their roles. Let's take a look, look at verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, okay, so what is his role? Head. His, his position? Of head of the wife. Head of the wife, okay? Let's take verse 25. Let's see, verse 25, verse 25 tells us now the husband must be the one to demonstrate, reflect Christ's love to his wife as Jesus loved the church. Read verse 25, Hillary, for us. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church yes. and gave himself for it. All right, love, right? Mm -hmm. Let's pause right there. And uh, how, which scripture clearly with specific details unfold love, the love of God, the character of God. First Corinthians 13. Is that in their homework? Yes. For married couples? Oh, yes. First Corinthians 13, which we're told we must read how often? Daily. Da especially, and okay, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. No, go ahead. Okay. Also, the closing scenes reveal beautifully the love of Christ and also the sacrifice because, of course, it says he, how Christ gave himself for the church. And so as we read those closing scenes of Christ's life, you know, we see demonstrated that love exercised to us. So the husband is the head. He must demonstrate God's love, not just some frivolous, intangible love, love six sentimentalism, mm -hmm. but love in principle. Love in Christ, 1 Corinthians 13, right? right. Then it says, uh, Christ loved the church and what now? And gave himself for, for it. it. What, what, what is that one word that encapsulates Christ giving himself sacrifice. as a what? As a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. So what is the role of the father, the husband? Sacrifice. He must make sacrifices, right? right. Verse 28. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. Notice now. So we must love, and if we love our wives, love her as we love our ourselves. Sales. Is that not a principle Christ laid out in Matthew 22, verse 38 through verse 40? What is the greatest commandment? Remember that? Mm -hmm. Amen? Yes. And Christ says now, Number one, the first is love thy, the Lord thy God. Amen. With all thy and number two, the second is love thy neighbor as, as, thy, thy, as thyself. So love your wife as you love your yourself. It's a life and death situation here, right? And Christ added, love thy neighbor as I, Jesus, love you. Hmm. Because some people don't even love themselves. That's true. So love as I love you, right? Mm -hmm. Let's take a look at verse 33. And verse 33 is critical. Why? Because as the husband, friends, hear this, as the husband manifests love, true love to his wife, then the wife will respond. And respond not negatively, but how? Positively. Positively. Because love begets love. Read that for us. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. So what will cause the wife to reverence her husband? Him showing love and sacrifice for his wife. Can you write down everybody first, John chapter 4, verse 19? I want to share with you a beautiful principle here, how the husband must mimic, imitate, reflect Christ, how he loves the church, right? Mm -hmm. In 1 John 4, 19, please hear this. The Bible says that we love him, because, Jesus. Why? Because he first loved us. So when Christ deals with the church, does Christ want the church to love him? Yes. yes right? Does a husband want his wife to love him? Yes. So, so what does Christ do? Who moves first? Christ or the church? Who loves first? Christ. Christ. Mm -hmm. So who must love first in the marriage? The husband. So now, when, when, when the marriage is broken, to whom does Christ go first? The Why husband. the husband? He's the head. He's, he's the head. Right. He's the head. And you begin from, from the top, the head. And that's why, yes. It just shows uh, the importance of the husband being connected to God. Because if God has not implanted 
his own love in the heart of the husband. If the husband does not love God himself, how can he love, as John says in 1 John, how can he love his Correct. brother or his wife, who he sees every day, if he doesn't even love and respect God? Mm. So the first step, he has to have a connection with God and love God supremely. Mm. And, and that is why in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 2, I believe, Hebrews chapter 2, the Bible says that when Christ comes, he's going to ask, not the wife, but who? The husband. Where's the flock? The beautiful flock I give unto you. So if marriages are broken, to whom does Christ go first? The husband. This is why. As, as we do marriage counseling, who do we focus on first? It has to be the husband. Because Christ is addressing the husband first. Mm -hmm. And this is a life and death situation. Many husbands want their wives to submit, their wives to reverence them, right? But they are not manifesting what like Christ? The love of love. Christ. Love. The mm -hmm. principle, principles in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Write the scripture down. I believe it's 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 6. 1 Peter Chapter 3 and verse 6, the Bible says that even Sarah called Abraham what? Lord. What now? Sarah called Abraham Lord. Now, that doesn't mean that Sarah looked at Abraham as the one who died for her. But the word Lord means respect. Mm -hmm. But notice now, what was the spiritual condition of Abraham for Sarah to call him Lord? Was he unconverted? No. No, he was not. And put down beside 1 Peter ch chapter 3, verse 6, Genesis 18, verse 19. Because God spake of the character of Abraham. He was converted. Amen. And one reason why um, wives are going to submit, verse 22 of Ephesians chapter 5, it's because the husband, like Christ, loved her as Christ loved the church. Amen. Amen, my friends. Amen. Amen. And this is, again, a life and death situation. Write down Colossians. Colossians chapter 3, I believe. Colossians 3. Let's read that. Colossians 3, because these two scriptures are very, very important, showing us that this is a life and death matter, especially for the husband. Because, again, if the husband does not love like Christ, and it's one thing, let me say this, it's one thing, if a husband is quick to say, I have to separate from my wife, I will get to separations and divorce in this series. We will get there. All right? I have to separate. Now, they may separate or they may divorce. We're not dealing with do they have grounds at, at this point. But in God's eyes, God looks at what the husband did to lead to this. How much sacrifice did he put into it? You hmm. see? So it's not how man looks and, and what man thinks and feels, but it's, it's what God says. What God says, what God observes. Colossians chapter 3, verse 18. Do you have it there, Hillary? Yes. All right. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Mm -hmm. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Be not what? Bitter. bitter. So if the husband is bitter against his wife, and there comes a separation, crisis in the marriage. How does God view it? The Bible says God is not going to answer the prayer of the husband. Wow. wow. Now think about that. If the husband is guilty and refuses to reconcile with his wife, to walk with the wife through the sanctuary, right? Mm -hmm. The Bible says if the husband is guilty, his prayers, God is not going to answer. Look at this. Go to 1 Peter. Is this a life and death situation we're talking about yes, here? Yes, absolutely. 1 Peter chapter 3 mm. and verse number 7. And for those of you online, Save to Serve International, who have sent us emails, called us, Pastor, please could you talk to my husband, talk to my wife, that they may watch the series? I can't do that. I can only pray for your husband and pray for your wife. Please, could you encourage them to walk in the path of reconciliation? I can't do it. I can only pray for them. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Hillary, what it says there, Hillary? Likewise, ye husbands, 
dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. Underscore that. Unto what now? The weaker vessel. Read on. Who is the weaker vessel? The, the wife. wife. Thank you. Read on. And as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be, be not, not hindered. hindered. Wow. Think about that. So if the husband is bitter, if the husband is guilty for this crisis, for this marriage, and refuse to repent, refuse to be reconciled to God with his wife. Now, if the wife refuses to be reconciled, mm -hmm. God looks at the heart of the husband. Mm -hmm. Are you willing? Make sense now? Mm -hmm. The to Bible prepare. says, what will happen to his prayers if he does not seek God reconciliation? His prayers will be hindered. Will be hindered. Will not be answered. And this brings us to Revelation 3, no? Mm-hmm. Which, where Christ says, I wish you were hot or cold, but because you are lukewarm, lukewarm. and neither hot nor cold, I will do what? Spew, the out, spew you out of my mouth. And the spewing out of the mouth means that God is not going to answer your prayers. Wow. That is uh, chapter 3 of Revelation, verse 15, verse 16 and write this quotation down where God is not going to answer your prayers. That is uh, Testimonies, volume 6, page 408. God is not going to answer your prayers. Go ahead, Hillary. And you know, even if, even if the wife is guilty and maybe the husband hasn't done anything, Correct. it's still he's unwilling to reconcile. Let's say it's a fault that she has done in the marriage relationship and he's not willing even to, to reconcile. That still is a problem, whether he's innocent in the situation, in the matter or mm. not. Because when you think about Christ's relation to the, church. to the church, you know, Christ never separates from his church. You know, Isaiah 59 tells us it's our sins and iniquities that have separated between us and him. He hasn't gone anywhere. It's us that choose the, as the bride or the wife that choose to stray from him. And so the husband, even if he's innocent in a matter, he should still have that forgiveness and that love of Christ in his heart, you know, to to forgive and reconcile. I'm going to say this. Now, did I give the quote correctly? The quotation? Testimonies, volume six. What page I gave? Thank you. 408. Now, do you know what just occurred to me, Hillary? Mm -hmm. I believe that many of the marriages that are broken, husband and wife have separated. They did so, many of them, without an aggressive fight. And I'm likening this onto our individual self. Because we have to wrestle against sin. The flesh. We have to resist the flesh, right? Mm -hmm. We fight to receive salvation. And many a husband, many a wife give up too. Too easily. And they're too quick to say, I'm walking out. They're too quick to say, I'm leaving. And yet, many of them will tell you, no, we must wrestle against sin. Mm -hmm. Fight against sin. But when they're fought and issues in the marriage, they give up too? Too easily. Too, too easily. Wow. Go back with this, uh, with me. I was going to say with us. Chapter 5 of Ephesians. Mm -hmm. Let's look at another role God gave to the husband. Chapter 5 of Ephesians. Let's take a look at verse 26. And the point in verse 26, the husband, oh friends, I want God to speak to the husbands. I mean, we'll get to the wife. But God, to talk with the husbands, you give up too easily. If you knew, if you loved your children and you knew that somebody was trying to rip, to tear apart your relationship with your, with your son, with your daughter, would you not fight for that relationship? Oh, yeah. With, with you and your in. child? Yes. If you love somebody, mm -hmm. but husbands give up too Easily. Wives give up too easy, too quickly. We have to wrestle. If you believe, watch this now, the caveat. If you believe God brought you both together, is it not worth fighting for? Mm -hmm. You think when, if you believe God brought you all together, all right? You, you believe that 
the devil is going to sit back, relax, and not give you a hard time to break up what God has put together? Everything God has put together, what is Satan's plan? Trying to divide asunder. And in a spiritual sense, did God, watch a point, did God not give us a Sabbath? Oh, yes. Now, is there a man of sin who gave us Sunday or yep. gave the world Sunday? Yes. Do we not keep the Sabbath, uphold the Sabbath, defend, proclaim us, defend yes. it, hold on to it? Did Continue God not give us the marriage? Yes, on the sixth day. And yet we give, we give up how, Hillary? Too easily. Because the flesh isn't dead, you know. Self. We want to... We wanna retain our own way, our own habit. It's yeah. too hard for us to yeah. change. Correct. And so yeah. we just yeah. give up. And many times as some folks have called us, and you know this, you also know this, Hillary, many folks have called us saying that the husband or the wife refuse to study these principles out together. Why? Because that spouse does not want to hear nor see truth. They don't want to change, but they don't know God is going to judge them, not only based on what they know, but what they have the opportunity to know. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. All right, Hillary, mm -hmm. verse 26 of chapter five of Ephesians, the role of the husband again, not only is he the head, but also the priest the spiritual leader in the home. And as a result, he is the one to call worship in the home. Let's read that. Verse 26. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Mm -hmm. Verse 27. That he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Now notice. So is he called to be the spiritual leader yes. in the home, mm -hmm. right? And we're told, write this reference down. We're told in Adventist home, page 212, the husband, blue words on top, he's a lawmaker. The husband, red words, he is the priest. But this is a sentence I want us all to pay attention to. It's beautiful. Why? Because this sentence along with chapter 5 of Ephesians, verse 26 and verse 27, show us the husband is to take his family, his wife, and walk them through the sanctuary from the okay. altar of sacrifice all the way to the most holy place. Amen. Watch the point. Hillary, red words, first sentence there. Red words, the father. The father is in one sense the priest of the household. Beautiful. Laying upon the altar of God the morning and evening sacrifice. Okay, based on the sanctuary layout, where does the morning and evening sacrifice take place? The brazen altar. At the altar. Thank yes. you so much. Go back now. Chapter 5 of Ephesians. Read verse 26 again. And I want you to tell me if you see a ministration at the laver, at the what? The laver. What was placed in the laver, Hillary? Water. All right, let's take verse 26. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. With the washing of what? Of water. And which, uh, uh, oh, that's the laver, that's the right. washing, right? Yes. Then it says, the washing of water by the? Word. So from the laver, where do we go next? Word. Laver, word. The holy place. Come on, place. where? The holy place. And what is in the holy place? Word. Table the bread. of showbread. Table of showbread. Amen. This is the work of the Father. Right. And as you mentioned before, it's a life and death matter. And you mentioned the spewing out. So not only will God not confess the prayers or the mm. name, but he will spew the husband out of the sanctuary. He'll have to go out from the holy place, out past the laver, past the brazen altar, and out the gate. And we don't want to be spewed out of the sanctuary because if we're spewed out, that means our names are also spewed out of the book of life. So here we are at the table of showbread, right? Right. By the washing of water, laver, By amen. The word. By the word, right? Table yes. of showbread. Then it brings us into the most holy place. What work is Christ doing now in the most holy place? Let me ask them. What work is Christ doing now in the most holy place? Interceding. What else? The blotting out of sin. All right. What else? Judgment. Judgment, right? Mm -hmm. Will he declare us clean and holy? Read verse 27 now, Hillary. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot mm -hmm. or wrinkle or any such thing, 
but that it should be holy and without blemish. Do you see that Praise now? Praise God. That's the most holy place experience. That's the goal. That he might present it unto himself a what church? A glorious church. Not having what? Spot, blemish, or any such thing. But it shall be what? Holy, holy and without blemish. That's the most blemish. holy place language, my friends. This is the work of whom? The Father. That is his work. Now, I want you all to write down these eight principles now. Bullet points. Watch the point here. Number one, we see marriages being destroyed. And one of the reasons why the husband is not performing his God-given role. Number one, he is overworking. Hmm. And as a result, he gives his wife not enough attention, not enough affection. He's causing the wife to starve of his what? From his what? Attention. Attention and what? Mm -hmm. Affection. Affection. That's number one. Number two. Number two. Another reason why many marriages are broken, falling apart. The husband loves to boast. As we call it, braggadocious, right? Mm -hmm. Loves to boast. And what is he saying in the home? I'm the man. I'm the head. Listen what the Lord's messenger says about the husband doing this. Adventist homepage 215. It is no evidence of manliness in the husband for him to dwell constantly upon his position as head of the family. It does not increase respect for him to hear him quoting scripture to sustain his claims mm. to authority. It will not make him more manly to require his wife, the mother of his children, to act upon his plans as if they were infallible. Let's not read all of it. Skip on down. Red words. Let every husband who claims to love God carefully study the requirements of God in his position. Christ's authority is exercised in what? Wisdom, in all kindness and gentleness. So let the husband exercise his power and what now, Hillary? Imitate the great head of the church. And that's what we hear of and see in some marriages. That's right. How the husband likes to boss around the wife. That is not the role that God gave to the husband. And a lot of times it's because the husband has a, a insecurity, a deep insecurity. And so to make himself uh, feel better or even look better or even look a certain way in the eyes of the wife, he, you know, goes on the other extreme. I'm the head. I'm, I'm this. You must do what I say. Mm. If, if you have to say that as a husband, something is wrong. Your wife must know that based on your tone, your words, your mannerism, your actions, right? As you manifest the characteristics of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Next, number three, we see how many marriages fall apart because the husband is verbally abusive and physically abusive. Mm -hmm. And we will address physical abuse and what the wife, if she's the one, the victim, must do if this is what she is experiencing. Mm -hmm. But many marriages fall apart because of this. Yes. Now, does this mean there cannot be reconciliation? There can be reconciliation. If they're walking step by step through the sanctuary, if both are willing and obedient. Next, write this quotation down. Adventist Home, page 224. I want to ask you a question. Have you ever heard of, see your father, see your uncle, walk into the home and just begin to scold his wife why, why the food is not cooked? Why my meal is not ready? Sister White says, this is not the work God gave to the husband. That's not his responsibility. Scolding, censoring his wife. Why? The meals are not ready on time and the house is not kept tidy when he doesn't even have sympathy with the wife or mother and what she has been going through since he left the house. Let's read this. Adventist Home 224, blue words. They frequently come to their homes with clouded brows, bringing no sunshine to the family circle. If the meals are not on time, the tired wife, who is frequently housekeeper, nurse, so here we're seeing some of the roles of the mother, which Cor we'll get to shortly. Correct. But... Uh, the tired wife, who is frequently housekeeper, 
nurse, cook, and housemaid all in one is greeted with, with fault, fault finding. finding. That happens a lot. It's and, happening, yes. And a lot of times they come home with clouded brow because uh, whatever stress or burden they went through at work, a lot of times they just un unleash it on the wife or the children and or the children. I want you to tell us locally and say to serve online about this other issue that breaks up marriages when the husband acts like a border. What does that mean? Well, it means that he basically just comes and goes in the house, in and out of the house at whatever times, doesn't tell the wife where he's going, and he just basically comes there to sleep, to eat, and then he's gone again, you know, as if he's in a hotel. <laughs> Could that be a healthy marriage? But do we not know, have seen marriages like that? Mm -hmm. Now, what do we do when we reserve a room at a hotel and actually stay overnight, two days, three? How do we, how do some people, some people treat the hotel room? Well, if they know that room service is coming, they're not careful to um, maintain or yes. to, yes. you know, keep yes. it tidy. And yes. a lot of time, you know, if the husband is behaving this way, he comes in and out. He may use dishes or whatever or, you know just leave things all over the place because he views the wife as That's the maid word. or the, the housekeeper. So he doesn't even try the to- The slave. Yeah, the slave. Doesn't spend any time with her or the children if there's Correct. children in the home. Just comes and goes as he pleases. Look at this. Adventist Home, page 217. It says, there is a tendency for the husband to feel free to go out and come into his home more as a- A boarder. Than a husband of the family circle. Domestic duties, the context now, domestic duties are sacred and important, yet they are often attended by a weary monotony. The countless cares and perplexities become irritating without the variety of change and cheerful relaxation, which the husband and father frequently has in his power to grant her, if he choose or rather if he thought it necessary or desirable to what? To do so. And we read the one of the first statements dealing with the role of the husband is to be a house band, Correct. binding the family together with ties of love. And if he's coming and going, mm. he's not banding anything. Mm. He's the loose um, link, as you would say. He's not binding the family together. He's Correct. just really evading uh, responsibil his responsibilities in the home. Let's think for a minute on a family. Next point, a family who does not, married couple, that does not profess Christianity, right? How many families do you know have fallen apart because the husband is a gambler? Do gamblers lose big many times? What happens to the income, the revenue stream coming into the home then? Depleted. All right. And what happens many, many times in those marriages when the husband is a gambler, a spendthrift, a prodigal? They go into debt. They, he may begin to pawn some of, the, <laughs> some of the possessions of the home. Does this bring stress on, on husband and wife? Yes. Many times? But in a Christian home, what happens? Do we have many a husband that also is a spendthrift? And as a result, the family is driven into financial debt. Will that bring a strain upon the marriage? Right. Yes. Living above yes. means. What now, Hillary? Living above means. They didn't their hear means. you. They didn't hear you. Oh, I said people wanting to live above their means. And so they're taking out credit to get things that they don't have money to pay for, things that they don't even need, really. And uh, some of you, this might not be your issue in your marriage, but let me tell you, we have dealt with families. Married couples, it is one of the main issues, breaking marriages, money, mm -hmm. money. And the love of money is what, Hillary? The root of all evil. And statistics show that, you know, that's one of the main causes for just divorces in general uh, is over money. Next point. Let's talk about the mommy's boy. Well, a lot because of... Because again, yeah. again, many marriages, many a wife becomes fed up with the husband, because the husband is acting like mommy's boy. I give the same title again. Talk to us, Hillary. 
Well, a lot of times whenever there's uh, problems to be solved in the marriage or whatever, and this kind of goes back to the sacred circle, but a lot of times he's always running to mom or always comparing his wife to his mom. Mm. You know, you don't cook the way my mom did or, you know, and everything is... Pause. Pa mm -hmm. Don't lose your thought. How would the wife feel if the husband always um, contrasts the cooking of mom with the wife? to degradate the wife, to make her feel small. Well, that's the effect. How would she feel? Yeah, she would have no um, esteem. Exactly. She would have no, uh, yeah, she would lose her, her worth. Correct. Her worth in Christ. Correct. And this is what's happening in many marriages. I know you have uh, many a wife who say, I don't like how my husband is acting. He's acting also childish. Think about this. You get married to a husband. His work is to be the tiller, the primary provider, and he's acting like a child. Do you know many marriages you find husbands acting childish? Yes, there are. And a lot of times the husband looks to the wife to be that mother figure. And so he doesn't exercise any problem-solving skills or he doesn't use his mind, but it's just... He wants her to make all the decisions, and he's supposed to be the head, the, the spiritual priest of the home, but he's always looking to wife to be a mother figure to him. And age isn't always a factor. Sometimes it may be if she's older, but even if, even if she's not, we've seen it time and time again. He just does not want to grow up. And, of course, they say that, mm. you know, women mature uh, quicker than men, but, I mean, that's the world. If you're walking in Christ you know, you should become a new creature in Christ. So you cannot use that as an excuse. You have to grow up and be a man. So are we telling husbands to grow up and be a man? In Christ, amen. Ex exactly. Because by pushing the wife to make decisions that God gave the husband to make, you are now putting her into a realm, an arena. God did not wire her to operate in that sphere. Make sense now? Mm -hmm. What is my role? Look at this statement, Adventist homepage 213. A father must not be as a child, moving merely by impulse. He is bound to his family by sacred, holy ties. What his influence will be in the home will be determined by his knowledge of the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. When I was a child, Paul says, I spake as a child. I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. The father is to stand at the head of his family. Not as an overgrown, undisciplined boy. But as a man with manly character and with his passions controlled. Pause right there. Let that, Hillary, please, red words again. The father is to stand at the head of the family. Not as an overgrown, undisciplined boy, but as a man with manly character and with his passions controlled. And of course, we're speaking to those who are walking through the Correct. sanctuary. So we're not Correct. even considering those, you know, in mm -hmm. the world or those mm -hmm. that are nominal no. and not no. in the sanctuary. But a lot of times you find um, men, and we're not bashing men because we're going to get to the roles of, of women as Correct. well and how they're responsible for breaking down marriages as well. But... You'll find that they want to play video games. They want to just go out with other friends, mm. you know, and correct, maybe correct. Um, do sports and things like that. And unfortunately, you even find some of that among those that are professing to be yes. in present truth. Yes. And it's just inexcusable. Grown up. And even though it may not be video games, they find some other outlet, you know, to exercise their immature-ish... Um, there, there's, a, there's a family that we counseled and the husband, the wife would complain that he would sit down and watch cartoons all day. If he could not go to work, stay home and watch cartoons. Hasn't grown up yet. And the same things he sees on cartoons, he acts out in the marriage. Tell me now, friends, would, would wives, would you tolerate that? How long? No, you would not. You're shaking your head saying, no, pastor. We would not tolerate the one who is called to be the head of the family acting as a boy. And even though that happens, the husband is guilty. Should the wife denigrate the husband and talk down to him? No. 
No. No. She should try to win him, of course. And, and we'll get to that. Let's go to another one. Who is called to be the primary breadwinner in the family? Who? The wife or the husband? The husband. The husband. God speaks to Adam, you dress, you keep the garden. Mm -hmm. Dress means to what? Till. Mm -hmm. So you get Work. harvest. Mm -hmm. So Adam was to bring in the harvest. The wife is to help. How many marriages are broken, husband, wife separated, because the husband refused to find employment? He's lazy. He's indolent. Right. He says, look, let the wife work and take care of me. And, he, and I know of a case where the husband, after he is reproved, he would act as if he's looking for a job. So he fills out application, goes on maybe one or two interviews, and then go right back to the same condition he was in before he was reproved. It's just cyclical. How many wives would sit down and tolerate that? Would you, wives? No, you would not. Right. And sometimes if he does find employment, it's very, very temporary. And so he Correct. may work for Correct. a month or two and Correct. then something happens and lose the job and it keeps happening. And then until finally he, he really doesn't want to work. That if you get down to the nitty gritty, that's what it is. He doesn't want to work. And let's just say this. Number one, there are cases where in times are hard, difficult to find job. And sometimes the wife, the woman, might be able to secure employment and not the husband at a specific time. They should come to an agreement saying, listen, honey, since you can find a job right now, employment, you go work, but I will keep looking aggressively, right? But she's working on it temporarily, amen? And as soon as he finds employment, what must happen? Right, they must assume their roles that God has given them. Their God-given roles, mm -hmm. all right? But now we're seeing that husbands do not want to work. Husbands must pattern after Jesus. You go back to creation. When did God create Adam and Eve? Before he placed everything? In order. In order or after? After, after. he put everything First day of creation, mm -hmm. second day, sixth day, when everything was put in order, then he created Adam and Eve. Family, right? Right. And notice, John 14, Christ says, I go to prepare a what? A place for you. So as the husband, he makes ready the place for his church. First, yes. and then brings them yes. to himself. And a husband, now, let's pause. So what is God saying now? to a man and a woman who are courting, desiring to be married. Let's move on. Yes, and also when you look at in Bible times, uh, the man had to supply a dowry, you know, before he got married Correct. as well to show that he Correct. would be able to take care of his Correct. family Correct. in the long term. And in Bible times, that father would not have allowed his daughter to be married to a man who could not provide. Mm -hmm. And how many marriages do you know of where the husband is indolent, refused to seek steady, consistent employment? Right. And we do have to make a, a disclaimer here that sometimes there are cases where the husband cannot work. Correct. Disability or what have you. We're not dealing with those cases. We're talking Correct. about able-bodied um, individuals that should be able to um, work. Now what, so we covered the, the roles of a husband mm -hmm. and what he should not do, things which are destroying marriages. Right. Now what if there's, there's a case we're in, a wife realizes the husband refused to perform his God's given role. What must a wife do? Must well, she play the role of the husband? What must she do? Talk to us. Well, Hillary. she must get on her knees, of course, fast and pray and encourage him to, to, you know, man up, as it were, to, you know, fulfill the roles that Correct. God has given him. Correct. Let's apply this first and come back to the church. Why, what is one of the reasons why women seek to become elders, pastors? Right? Mm -hmm. When that was not the role God gave to a woman based on scripture. Why? What do they say the woman? 
Well, the men aren't the men aren't doing their job in the church, right? They're not stepping up, or exactly. there's not enough men, mm. Mm -hmm. or they're not doing it right. What happened to Uzzah when the ark was teetering in the balance? He reached out to to um, prevent it from falling. So, if if a husband, wives, if your husband is not performing his God-given roles, don't try to be the man in the home. God did not create you to do that role. You must encourage, pray and encourage. Make sure you're, you are encouraging, not discouraging. Because even in your efforts to encourage, your tone, your mannerism, your words may, dis, may denigrate the very one you're trying to uplift, to encourage him to perform his God-given roles. Go to 1 Peter yeah. chapter 3. And it may drive him even further. Um, you Away know. from his God's given role. Right. Correct. First Peter, chapter three. Let's take a look at verse one. What it says there, Hillary. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, mm -hmm. that if any obey not the word, they also may, without the word, be won by the conversation of the wives. Amen. Go to Proverbs 31. Everybody, go to Proverbs 31. Here is God laying out the roles of wives. Right. Proverbs chapter 31. And yes. Before we move on, well, I think this is a good transitional point as well to show that um, sin came into the world really by Eve not appreciating mm -hmm. the role that God gave her and wanting to reach a higher role, as oh, it were. She yes. wanted to ascend even past the, the role of the husband. She wanted to ascend even to the Godhead. Mm -hmm. She wanted to be like God her eyes open, knowing good and evil. Correct. And as a result of her not being content in her own role, she fell far below mm. um, the role that God even initially intended for her. Restless, modern-day Eves. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's take a look at Proverbs chapter 31. Wives, mothers, listen up. Verse number 11, put this down. Proverbs 31, verse 11 through verse 12. Look at the duty the role God gave to the woman, the wife, Hillary. The heart, well, who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies. That's verse 10? Yes. Okay. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her mm. so that he shall have no need of spoil. That, that's verse 12. Verse 10 and 11. Verse 12. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. So verse 11, do we, what characteristic trait must the wife have? Well, she must be trustworthy. That's it. Mm -hmm. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her. And many marriages are broken because the husband cannot what? Trust, trust. the wife. Trust the wife. Trust. And trust. a lot of times it goes back to her mannerisms. If she's very flirtatious, it goes back to the dress. Um, he's wondering, okay, why are you dressed this way? Or why are you moving around this way? So... Are you giving your husband a reason not mm. to trust you by the way you talk, the way you interact, the way you dress, etc.? Verse 26, second point, verse 26, the role of the wife. Verse 26, the Bible says she must be converted. Yes. And her tongue, let's read that. Verse 26, what it says there, Hillary? She openeth her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. Mm. So now what is in her tongue? Cursings? Mm. No. The law of kindness. The law of kindness. Mm -hmm. Is she converted? Yes, she is converted. She opened her mouth with wisdom. And we're told that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. wisdom. And out of the mouth flows the issues from the heart. So if wisdom is flowing out of her mouth, then of course she has the wisdom or the fear of God in her heart. So she is converted. Come to verse 13. She seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. So is she idle? Not at is all. Is she lazy? No. The duty of the mother is to work in the home primarily. Go to verse 19. She layeth her hands to the spindle and her hands hold the distaff. Verse 27 now. She looketh well to the ways of her household and, and eateth not the bread of idleness. So is she idle? No. No. Is she working in the home? Yes. Yes, she is. Yes. Mm -hmm. Skip one down to verse number 14 and 15. She is like the merchant's ships. She bringeth her food from afar. She riseth also while it is yet night and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. I'm going to say this. It was strange to me 
especially growing up in my, let me pause right there. Based on my background history, it was very strange to me as I began to counsel with married couples that I found out that many a husband and wife have separate bank accounts. They are married, but the husband doesn't allow the wife to have any uh, credentials mm -hmm. for that online account. Hmm. Verse 14, verse 15 says what now? What's her role? She's she is like the merchant ships. Merchant ships. Merchant spells what? Money, business. Business, money. So should the wife handle the money in the home? Mm -hmm. Based on scripture, the wife must handle the money. The husband works, but the wife does what? Handles the money. Now, if your wife is not as industrious as the husband, it's the husband's duty to train the wife. Right. Because this is what God's word says. Now, many a times, a husband and a wife may have separate accounts for various reasons, right? But I was shocked to realize husband and wife don't have the same bank accounts. Mm -hmm. And the wife said, well, he works his money. Pastor, I don't know how much money he makes. And when I ask for anything, he tells me, he tells me to go work. Wow. <laughs> it happens in families, in, mar and, in married relations. And worldly counseling, um, premarital counseling, will sometimes will po point people in the direction of getting a prenuptial agreement. So they have this, this idea that if something should happen in the marriage, you know, hmm. I have mine secured and you oh, have yes. your money secured. Oh, yes. So they go in with it thinking that this isn't going to work out. And just in case it doesn't Correct. work out, Correct. you know. And as a result, this series is not for those people. are for people who are walking in the sanctuary, through the sanctuary, seeking not their own way, but... God's, God's way. way. Thy way, O oh Lord, is in the... In the so sanctuary. when we come to God, whose ways must be put aside? Our ways. And that's why we don't start with the issues, the bread. We begin in the courtyard. Adventist mm -hmm. homepage 378. Blue words. Well, from top. You must help each other. Do not look upon it as a virtue to hold fast husbands. Listen. Do not look upon it as a virtue to hold fast the purse strings refusing to give your wife money. So what is he doing? Withholding. Now, is he selfish or is he kind? Selfish. selfish. Is that love? No, love is kind. Amen? Amen. Look at this now. You should allow your wife a certain sum weekly and should let her do what she please with this money. Right. You have not given her opportunity to exercise her tact or her taste. Watch this. Because you have not a proper realization of, of the, the position, position that a wife should occupy. So what's her position then? What's her role? To be able to manage money. Your wife has an excellent and well-balanced mind. Now, just as we said, if the husband is not playing his role, what must the wife do? Encourage him. So if the wife is not as industrious as the husband, what must he do based on God's bread? You must encourage her likewise. Give your wife. Blue words, Hillary. Give your wife a share of the money that you receive. Let her have this as her own and let her use it as she desires. She should have been allowed to use the means that she earned as she, mm -hmm. as she in her judgment deemed best. If she had had a certain sum to use as her own without being criticized, criticized. a great weight would have been lifted from her mind. And we're not talking about unconverted people Correct. here. They Correct. would just go out and just splurge and just buy foolishness, right. vanity. Correct. You know, Correct. If, since the wife is called to manage things in the home, Correct. she knows the necessities of the home. She knows Correct. what groceries are needed in the home. Correct. And so by her having this money, she's able to appropriate the funds where needed. Correct. If is the children need things or Correct. what have you. Correct. If I'm on the road, for example, and you're at home and you say, go to, the, you know, go to the store, I don't know what to buy. Why? You run. That's your sphere, right? Amen? Amen. So that's why we have to allow. You're not certain. You certain? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Amen. All right. Amen. Amen. So it's the wife's duties. And let me say this. Let me say this. Let me say this. Let me say this. Many, many times, hear me, this is why 
God's word do not encourage young people getting married who don't have life experiences. Many a wife does not or was not trained in the domestic affairs of the home. What Amen. are they? What are they? Well, cooking, cleaning, ironing, sewing, sewing every, baking bread, all of that, all of that. Managing money, right? Right. So what must a husband do? And if he know, if he's more experienced, what must he do? Encourage. Encourage. Not speak down. And if they are not converted, yielding to uplift each other, it's going to bring a crisis in the marriage. That's right. Understand this now. Let's go spiritual. If you knew a brother was on his way out from Christ, but really desiring to follow Christ, would you not give all to see that brother be drawn closer to Christ? Oh, definitely. So if your wife has been given, God-given duties, but she was not trained by her mother, how many of you know mothers who petted, pampered, shielded their children, their daughters, and did not educate them, train them in domestic affairs? How many know them? Yes. And they get married. At, put your hand up. And they get <laughs> married at a tender age Right? Tend to like, like what, 20, 21, 22? Just out of college. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I'm going to be transparent. I'm one of those, <laughs> one of those people because... <laughs> Dwayne, cut. cut. <laughs> <laughs> no, but in a lot of American households, um, and the par this is not to fault the parents because they are doing, you know, what they thought was best at the time. They think, okay, it's your responsibility as a young person to go to school, to make good grades That's so true. you could get a That's good true. job and we'll mm -hmm. take care of you know we'll take care of you Correct. while you're in school just focus Correct. maintain your GPA and is this the truth yeah now can you stop talking now so then when they get ready to get married Correct. you know they're not they may have you know a, a 4.0 they oh, yeah. may know book knowledge and everything but then when it comes to the practical life skills they have to learn those things and Correct. it's it's very difficult because they did not come up learning them. Correct. Let's go now. Back to Proverbs 31. 31. Let's take a look at verse 16. Mark these verses. Verse 16 through verse 22 and verse 24. The duty of the mother, the wife, is missionary work. But missionary work, we're first. Well, primarily in her household. How many wives are, are mothers, slash mothers, are running from their first duty. A lot. And some of the ones that aren't, because I've received a lot of questions um, from a lot of sisters that are kind of discontent and sometimes, you know, when they're hearing about the end times, of course, we know Jesus is soon to come and it's like, I want to do more. I want to, you know, go out and I want to, they have, you know, lofty plans and goals and those are commendable. But then they have children in the home and it's like this. And if you read Ellen White, you know, on the duty and the role of the mother in training the children, she puts this as the highest missionary work. And I always encourage them and I encourage myself as well. This is the work before us as mothers to train minds, to prepare souls for heaven. You can't get any any greater than that. You know, when you think of Moses, yeah. Moses is training. And she brings out Moses even in the Adventist home on that and how if his mother wasn't faithful in performing her duty and training him in the precepts of God's word, he wouldn't have been able to fulfill the position that he has fulfilled. And so we shouldn't be restless as women and as mothers mm. wanting to do more when God has given us a field right in our homes, you know, and and while we're doing that missionary work, it's also a work that's helping to refine our character. And as the children go grow older, you can go out and knock on doors with the children and Thank do you. it together. Correct. You're Correct. training them. Correct. And so it's just beautiful. Just read the spirit of prophecy on the role and the duty of a mother. That over and over, she's taught, that is the primary role, <laughs> sorry, of the mother is to be that um, educator and trainer of her children. You know, I'm smiling over here. Would you all, all agree with us that the, the work of a minister is a sacred work? Sacred. What is the sacred work of a mother? Sacred, keyword. 
operative word sacred. Look at the screen right here. Now, we won't give you all of this. I want to find a key phrase right here. Sacred. All right? Okay. Look at this right here. Blue words on top. Mm -hmm. We may safely say that the distinctive duties of woman are more sacred, more holy than those of man. We don't. Let woman realize the sacredness of her work and in the strength and fear of God, take up her life mission. So we see that as God called men to a sacred work in the pulpit, mothers are called to a sacred work where? In the home. But many a mother lay aside her true sacred work for which work? The man's sacred work, and mm -hmm. that was not what God called her to do. Red words. Yeah. Amid. Amid all the activities of life, the mother's most sacred duty is to, to her children. But how often is this duty put aside that some selfish gratification may be followed? What an important work. Thank you. Let's go to verse 23. Yes. And I just wanted to say a lot of times what's actuating, and not in most cases, but in some cases, what's actuating the woman to want to reach a higher um, Mission, mission field, as it were, is because she doesn't get any um, commendation praise, yes. or any praise or any public, you know, commendation. <laughs> so now she wants to be on the front line, Correct. standing in the pulpit, preaching or That's doing true. this or doing that. Mm. But the motive isn't souls. The motive is self. So we really have to examine ourselves and our motives and take up the duties that God has given us and be content. And fall on our knees and ask God that we might be able to fulfill that sacred mission. Mm. Look how important the work of the wife is. And once she performs her duties, notice how the husband is treated in the marketplace. Verse number, what, 23? Mm -hmm. Yes. Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. And uh, go to Proverbs chapter 12. Proverbs chapter 12 and verse number 4. So because the, the wife performs her God-given duty, how is the husband treated? He's respected. Respected. Mm -hmm. That means many a times people lose respect for the husband by the lack of the wife doing her God-given role. Wow. Hmm. Let me say it this way. Do you know you can have an elder in the church? Hello? A deacon in the church? a pastor in the church, male figure now, but what the wife does, how the wife speaks to other people, how the wife dresses, the people in the church lose respect for whom? The deacon, mm -hmm. the elder, the, pa the husband of that wife. Right. Does it make sense, friends? Yeah, and that's why the Bible tells us that if the husband is not able to rule his own household, not. he's not fit Should to be a, a leader in the church. Okay, that was Proverbs 12, verse 4. Mm -hmm. Let's move on. Proverbs 21. Go there now. Now, notice. So we talk about the role, Proverbs 21, the role of the wife that God gave to her, right? Mm -hmm. And number one, that she should make sure she takes care of home, right? Now, hear me, hear me. Some people will find fault and criticize that point. Well, I have to work. I'm educated. Right, because I got to pay bills. Hmm. Do you see why we shouldn't start here addressing husband and wife? We must start educating young people that they don't go in debt. You're not hearing this thing, friends. Because once they get married, the husband, husband he brings his load of debt. The wife brings her barrel of debt. Right? <laughs> and now, one income cannot pay the bills. Mm -hmm. So do what you can do for now. But remember the goal in mind. Because whenever you stray from God's ideal, you will have problems. Right. And it's worse when children come into the picture. Because then we just found what the highest duty of the mother is in training her mm -hmm. children, you know, for this life and for the life to come. She's unable to do that because she's working. So who's raising the children? You have to send them somewhere else. You don't know what's being fed to them. And it's just not the way God would have it. Should the wife just stay home and watch TV all day? No. Talk on the phone all day? 
No. Well, I must stay home. I must stay. I'm a homemaker. On the internet, surfing, who knows, all day, right? Is that the work of the mothers? No. 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 What about just staying home and just shopping online? That's not the role Spending either. what they don't have. But how many marriages, how many husbands become fed up with his wife because all she does is spend and waste their, their income? Am I right or wrong, my friends? Yes, yeah. it's happening. It's happening. How many wives are contentious? Go to Proverbs, 20, Proverbs uh, 27. Where are you? 21? Uh, 21. Read mm -hmm. verse 9. It is better to dwell in a corner of the housetop than with a brawling woman in a wide house. Wow. Verse 19 again. 19. It is better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious and an angry woman. Now, picture, what, wow. do, you, what do we find in the wilderness? Do we find beasts? Yes. Do we find critters? Famine sometimes. Snakes <laughs> and, and hogs, war hogs. It's better to dwell with the beasts of the field. The elements. <laughs> than to be with a wife who is unconverted. We read Proverbs 27, 15. Now, we, so now what happens is many a times a husband just divorce for that reason. We'll come to that. Mm -hmm. We'll come to that. Verse 15. A continual dropping in a very rainy day and a contentious woman are alike. Think about that. Drop, 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 drop. A nagging woman. Drop, 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 drop. She's, na <laughs> that's it. She, she's a nagging woman and a very needy woman. It's a balance now. Because a woman, oh my Lord, Lord help me to articulate this. Genesis chapter 3 verse 16. God said to, to Eve, your desire shall be towards whom? To your husband. Your husband. So she wants that fellowship. She wants it. And because of sin, the woman can become, Hillary, how? Needy, how? Yeah, needy. <laughs> Nagging, right? Nagging. Right. Now, under, underscore this point. Many times, husbands, and I'm going to address this later on, many times husbands, they cheat on their wives because... The wife has neglected personal hygiene. She does not dress attractive anymore. And that needs to be qualified because the world's idea of woman dressing attractive is not the biblical way, but modestly. But she lets herself go. I mean, do you comprehend that? Mm -hmm. Right? And let's just put this disclaimer. That is no excuse. Even if she is doing these correct, things, of correct, course, there's no, no excuse for breaking any of God's commands. So we're talking about things that lead to that. Mm -hmm. I, mean, we, we, I mean, we'll address that. That lead to that because the woman is not doing what God has called her to do. Mm -hmm. Look what this statement says. Sisters, when about their work, should not put on clothing which would make them look like images to frighten the crows from the corn, Hillary. It is more gratifying to their husbands and children to see them in becoming well-fitting attire than it can be to mere visitors or strangers. I see many times the, woman, the, the wise, uh, wise mothers around their husband, children, they let themselves go any, any way, right? But when it's time to go out, now they want to fix up. It's a wrong way of doing things. Some wives and mothers seem to think it is no matter how they look when about their work and when they are seen only by their husbands. Doesn't matter how I dress in the home and children, but they are very particular to dress in taste for the eyes of those who have no special claims upon them. It is not the esteem and love of husband and children more to be prized than that of strangers or common friends? The happiness of husband and children should be more sacred to every wife and mother than that of all others. Take it. Next sentence. Many mothers think that anything is good enough for home wear, be it ever so soiled Soil and, and shabby. shabby. Listen to what happens next. 
when the wife, the mother dressed with soiled clothes and shabby, um, refused to brush her teeth, refused to comb her hair, wake up in the morning, don't wash her face. I mean, this happens. Don't bathe. Don't, don't, don't bathe. But they soon, wise mothers, lose their influence in the family. The children, the children now, Hillary. The children draw comparisons between their mother's dress and that of others who dress neatly, and, and their, their respect, respect for her is, is weakened. weakened. Have you ever heard the statement for husband and wife, continue the early attentions? When you were trying to attract your now husband, your now wife, how did you dress? How did you care for yourself? So no, I got her now. I got him now. And you start letting yourself just flay away. And it's wrong. Yes. And hear me now. Many, hear me, I know what I'm talking about. Many husbands use this as an excuse to commit adultery. But of course, it's still wrong. Wives, husband, uh, wise mothers, fix yourself up in the Lord. Amen. And in conjunction with this I point. I heard amen about the amen. <laughs> amen. In conjunction with this point, as far as um, not caring for the way their appearance is, a lot of times because they're at home, they neglect their health in every other aspect, hygienically, yes. but also in diet. So because they're in the home all day, they think that gives them free reigns to just eat at whatever time, snack in between meals, neglect exercise, and all the other eight principles of health that are laid out for us. And so as a result, um, the, she begins to look less attractive and less attractive. And of course, beauty is not, is not in the appearance, exterior. Right. Beauty is in the heart. Proverbs 31, favor is what? This, um, beauty is, is what? Is deceitful. Favor is what? Vain. But the one who finds that virtuous woman. One more point. God told Samuel what? Oh, man, man looks on what? On the outward appearance. But God looks where? On the so heart. So we get the point. But right. nevertheless, Isaiah 3 says, your, your countenance witness against you. Right. And not to mention, if you're not practicing the principles of health, yes. it is going to have an effect on the way you behave because it's going to affect your mind. It's going to affect the way you interact. If you're intemperate and neglecting hygiene and all the other things, you're going to be impatient you're going to not exercise the fruits of the spirit so they're all connected interconnected in closing let's say this put this point down it is not the role of the husband or the wife to submit himself herself to the lustful appetite of the spouse in the area of sexual intercourse do you hear me did you hear me? We're closing here. And I doubt we'll be able to unpack this. Because many times, you know what? Go to 1 Corinthians 7. Go there. 1 Corinthians 7. Go to 1, 1 Corinthians 7. This is another scripture, like last week. Many a husband, many a wife. Take out of context. Mm -hmm. It is not the role of the husband to think that the wife is just his tool or the wife to think that he's just her tool, that whatever lustful appetite, passion they have for the bed, anytime, anywhere, however frequent, you must just be at my disposal. Hmm. It is not the role God gave to husband, God gave to wife. Watch this. Verse 4. Uh, let's take it from verse number 4. Okay. The wife hath not power over her own body, mm -hmm. but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power over his own body, but the wife. Go to verse 6, Hillary. Okay. Uh, I think we have to read verse 5. Yes, verse, yeah, verse Defraud 5. Defraud ye not on the other, except it be with consent for a time, mm -hmm. that ye may give yourselves to fasting, fasting and prayer, and, prayer. and mm -hmm. come together again, that Satan tempt you not, Correct. for your in con 
incontinency. Mm -hmm. But I speak this by permission and not of commandment. So many husbands say, you see, the Bible says, I own your body. So whenever you get the point, right? And you'd be surprised how many folks we have counseled with and a husband would say, or husband mainly would say, my wife holds back from me. And when, you have to pray when you enter some of these counseling sessions because many times you'll find even husband and wife, they want to sit there and watch pornography to carry out their lustful passions, animal propensities. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. This is causing many a husband to one, commit adultery. Why? The wife won't give in. Or Divorce. Vice mm -hmm. Or vice versa. Mm -hmm. Or if, if the spouse doesn't want to give in, right? I own your body, give it to me, doesn't want to give in. If it's not adultery, if it's not divorce, then they begin to have self-abuse, masturbation, to please, to get rid of that, that, that desire, right? And number, th number four, you see them also watching those movies themselves, to gratify themselves because the spouse refuses to give in. Now, does this mean that they are justified because a spouse doesn't want to give in? And we're going to cover some things, my friends. Pray, pray that God reconciles some marriages. Watch this statement here. We're going to close right here because we can't cover this part, but it deals with the roles. The husband thinking, I own your body. The wife thinks, no, I own your body. Whenever I want it, how, however much, give it. Or Excess, however. Intemperance. Mm -hmm. All right. Page 123, Adventist Home. It is, go ahead, Hillary. It is not pure love which actuates a man to make his wife an instrument to minister to his lust. It is the animal passions which clamor for indulgence. How few men show their love in the manner specified by the apostle, even as Christ also loved the church. And gave himself for it that he might not pollute it, Sister White says, but sanctify and cleanse it that it should be holy and without blemish. This is the quality of love in the marriage relation which God recognizes as holy. Love is a pure and holy principle, but lustful passion will not admit of restraint and will not be dictated to or controlled by reason. It is blind to consequences. It will not reason from cause to effect. Wow. Page 124. What is the result of giving loose rein to the lower passions? The, watch this. The bedchamber. And we're going to, friends, by God's grace, we will uncover those scriptures in their right context. The bedchamber where angels of God should preside is made unholy by unholy practices. Not only excess now, but certain practices. Right should not be found in the marriage. And many a spouse say, no, 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 I like those practices. Right, the bed is undefiled. They'll use scriptures like that. Marriage is honorable. Mm -hmm. And if the spouse says no, then th that spouse go find it somewhere else, even watching things or self-abuse. Watch this. And because shameful animalism rules, bodies are corrupted. Loathsome practices lead, loathsome practices lead to what, Hillary? Loathsome diseases. That which God has given as a blessing is made a curse. Sexual excess will effectually destroy a love for devotional exercises, will take from the brain the substance needed to nourish the system, and will most effectively exhaust the vitality. No woman. That's your Hillary. No woman, no woman. No woman should aid her husband in this work of self-destruction. She will not do it if she is enlightened and has true love for him. Wow. We won't go into this any further into this. Has to be dealt with. Last week when we finished part three, someone zipped, flew me an email. Pastor, you spoke about husband and wife within that sacred circle, 
has an individual circle with Christ, mm -hmm. the individuality. And the husband should not blend his into hers, and the wife must not merge her individuality into the husband. Pastor, I understood that. But, but, what about 1 Corinthians 7? The, we, are we read it? Oh. That the husband uh, owns, basically, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, the body of the wife. Has the wife power. doesn't have, mm -hmm. he has power over her body, mm -hmm. and she has power over his yes. body, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. now, now, what if my husband is intemperate? And because I refuse to give in to his intemperance, or vice versa, that's why, Pastor, he's doing those things, adultery, etc. The question is, is he walking through the process of reconciliation exactly. through the sanctuary? So friends, mm -hmm. we, we, we don't know everything, but we have heard and seen and counseled many a family to know these things are destroying marriages. Reconciliation can be done if both are willing. So why can't we close on until we come back next week, Hillary? I want to close on Galatians 5 because husband and wife must manifest the character of Christ, Amen. play that role. Yes. And they must demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit. What's the last fruit? It's called faith, right? Mm -hmm. And before that one is a thing called intemperance. Mm -hmm. Love. You have it there? Verse yes. 22. And the what now? But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Temperance. Against such there is no law. The last one is what? Temperance. Foundation. We'll come to that. Because many are marriages are being destroyed because of what? Intemperance. Friends, we can't cover everything. We want to refer you to Adventist Home, the chapters, section nine and section 10. Section nine, not page, section nine, section 10. The roles, responsibilities and can I of also, husband and wife. and wife. And I also want to add also that um, when you read Adventist Home, because it is a compilation, there are original, um, uh, statements. Sources, sources, yeah, statements where from whence those particular passage were extracted from. So if you want to go even deeper, which we encourage you to, look where that um, excerpt was taken and go back to the original um, book and read it in its entirety. Father in heaven, we thank you for your words this evening and for what we have covered. Lord, save these marriages. It's your will. It's your will to reconcile us unto yourself, to break the hold of Satan upon us individually. It's your desire to break the hold of Satan over our marriages. Husbands, wives, give up too quickly. Give up too easily. Let's fight for what we believe you have put together. And even if, as we have read, some, a few marriages were done by mistake, God can still bring a blessing out of it. Keep us faithful until we meet again is our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, friends, I want to thank you again for joining us this Thursday for our session here. And by God's grace, we will resume on next Thursday at 7.30 p.m. This coming Sabbath, you may join us for worship at 11.30 a.m. Eastern Time. God bless until we meet again. Maranatha.